So I want to um, also want to acknowledge the Narragansett and Wampanoag peoples, as well as uh, acknowledge the Poconocket uh, and their claim here. To acknowledge this land and the enduring sovereignty of the indigenous peoples whose homeland this place sits. Thanks to the organizers of this event and the sponsors, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Sawyer Seminar on Race and Indigeneity in the Americas, Mahalo Nui Loa. Also, for those of you who have just come into the foyer on the foyers on either side, there is a streaming room. I believe it's the South Common Room upstairs. <clears throat> also, uh, especially for other Kanaka Oivi, Kanaka Maoli in the room, a uh, quick note in terms of Mo'oku Ohau, although I'm not uh, new to most of you, but I know there could be other people in the room. As my surname indicates, I come from the Kawanui Ohana. I am a diasporic daughter, uh, born and raised in Southern California on Gabrielino territory and then moved to Juaneño territory. And I'm Hawaiian on my father's side. And we hail from, at least in most, the most recent decades, our, my closest kin live in Anahola Hawaiian homelands on the island of Kauai. And the Kawanui line is my grandfather's line. Both my father's parents were Kanaka. And Kawanui takes us through Kanakakai homelands on Molokai. And we trace back to Nakihoa Kaumualii. And on my uh, father's mother's line, we trace all the way through various parts of Maui and Moku Okiave through my mother's uh, Mother, my grandmother's mother, uh, Annie Kohoohie Kane. Can you hear me in the back? It's a little awkward because I'm tall and the mic is, I'm used to the mic being a little higher. Coming to you from Connecticut, I reside and work in a place known as Middletown. The traditional place name is Matabeset or Matabesek, homeland of the Wangunk people who thrive in the 21st century. Wangunk the people at the bend of the river. The Wangunk historically presided over both sides of the Connecticut River in present day Middletown, Portland, Cromwell, Durham, Haddam, Wethersfield, East Haddam, East Hampton, Glastonbury, and Portland. I moved to Middletown from Santa Cruz, California in 2000. The city of Middletown was celebrating its founding, its settler founding, its 350th year. And I saw in the newspaper that they were going to have a parade and pageantry. And so I called city council and asked if the Indian tribe whose homeland were on, and I didn't know at the time who that was, that they were the Wangunk. And I wanted to know. I had been looking to try and find out whose land I was on. It wasn't clear to me before I moved there. This is something I learned how to do uh, first and foremost when I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley and heard Kawai Puna Prijin give a talk in 1989. And we were already bringing up Kanaka Maoli. I was working with Native Hawaiian com uh, community in the Bay Area. And we were bringing up our speakers to talk about the Hawaiian land situation. And this is prior to the US apology for the overthrow. So everything was a battle because <coughs> the US hadn't acknowledged the illegality of that overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. And I was so excited to meet Kawai Puna Prijin. And he said, I had just gotten there. I had transferred from community college in Southern California. And it was my first semester. And he said, if you're going to do that work, you have to work with the people of the land where you are now. And he knew that through his own ethics, but also because he had gone to the United Nations and had also worked with the International Indian Treaty Council. So this was part of how I was uh, cut my teeth politically. And so I was searching to find out whose land I was on when I moved to Matabeset, Middletown, 19 years ago. When I called city council and said, will there be any of the native groups of this land in that ceremony? They said, well, of course, people whose families who have been here for 350 years, the natives will be here. And I said, no, I don't mean white people as natives. I'm talking about American Indians. And what's the name of the tribe? Well, they didn't even actually know what I was asking or what I was after. There was deep confusion and irritation on the line. I got put on hold. Somebody brought a supervisor on the phone, ma'am. Is there a problem? Well, yes, there is. I'm just trying to figure out two things. The name of the tribe of the place now called Middletown, whose land we are on, and if they will be taking part in this 350th commemoration. He responded, they're extinct. 
So I asked, well, who are they? Or who were they? His answer, well, I don't know. Maybe you could call somebody at Foxwoods Casino and ask. I was incensed. I should note that I did not even get an easy answer on the phone when I telephoned the Connecticut Historical Society. But eventually, I did find out through scholar Paul Grant Costa, who was then completing his doctorate in history at Yale University, that it was the Wang Gunk. And literally within a week, I had been going through parts of uh, the <clears throat> northwest corridor of Connecticut, where the first Hawaiian was Christianized, Opukaha'ia, also known as Henry Obukaya. And I wanted to see this place of early Hawaiian presence uh, in Connecticut from the early 19th century. He arrived in 1809 on Captain Britnell's ship in New Haven. And I was excited. I had just moved there. I was trying to figure out the place and get my bearings. And I saw this place that said, Polynesian, all you can eat buffet. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> it, it was neither. But there was, a, <laughs> there was a placemat that was an antiquated outline map of Connecticut. And it had Wangunk right in the middle of it. I would later see this reproduction in Amy Denowden's book, Beyond Conquest. So it's a colonial map that they had made into paper placemats at this fake not all you can eat, non Polynesian buffet. I took it as a sign. Okay. I was like, should I go back to California, go to Hawaii? No. So, as I would eventually learn, while the official state doctrine still claims that the Wangunk are extinct, there are 21st century Wangunk people alive and thriving today. My talk here today seeks to examine that contradiction the legacy of erasure and invisibility and how to confront this history. The Wangunk people have endured colonial encroachment by the Dutch, the English, and the Americans for centuries. And despite contemporary US settler colonialism and its attendant erasure and denial of their presence, there are Wangunk people who still reside in their traditional territory. And for those of us who are not Wangunk and who live in their homeland, the time is long overdue to negotiate ethical relationships to the indigenous people of that place. This necessarily entails confronting what decolonization can mean in a settler colonial context, with a focus on learning the history of erasure and the erasure of history. As such, decolonization that includes a commitment to decoloniality should impact historical interpretation, and by extension, studies of race and ethnicity and indigeneity that challenge the logic of elimination. In hegemonic legal discourse, as well as dominant academic paradigms, discussions of decolonization most often take former franchise colonies as their point of reference. Post-colonial theory itself emerged from the study of the cultural legacy of colonialism and imperialism and how it endures after putative decolonization. An example would be Britain in North America, a settler colonial case, as distinct from Britain in India, a franchise colonial case. Additionally, core theories of decolonization are based on examples of African slave societies and emancipation from white supremacist violence and domination. Thus, intending to settler colonialism as an ongoing structure of domination, what decolonization must entail will differ than in other colonial situations. In Patrick Wolfe's theorization of settler colonialism, he argued that this model of domination operates by the logic of elimination of the native. And that's his phrasing and his concept. And he argues that that is the guiding or underwriting overarching logic because the acquisition of land is the central feature and hallmark of settler colonialism. As Wolf noted, because settler colonialism, quote, destroys to replace, it is, quote, inherently eliminatory but not invariably genocidal. He was careful to point out that settler colonialism is not simply a form of genocide, since there are cases of genocide without settler colonialism. And because, quote, elimination refers to more than the summary liquidation of indigenous peoples, though it includes that, end quote. Hence, he suggested that structural genocide avoids the question of degree and enables an understanding of the relationships between spatial <coughs> removal, mass killings, and coercive, for coercive forms of biocultural assimilation. In other words, the logic of elimination of the native is about the elimination of the native as native. And yet, to exclusively focus on the settler colonial without any meaningful engagement with the indigenous can reproduce another form of elimination of the native. 
right? And we're seeing this in terms of the ascendancy of settler colonial studies that people think is a gloss for native studies, and they're two different things. They're related, certainly, right? So that people will go to the American Studies Association conference and say, look at all the, Robert Warrior has written about this, uh, and he'll be in Honolulu uh, next week, I believe. You know, they'll say, look at all the native studies panels on the program. I'm like, not so much, right? And again, it's relational. Because settler colonialism is a land-centered project entailing permanent settlement, or at least settlers bid for permanency, as Wolf points out in the same essay I'm citing, quote, settler colonizers come to stay. In invasion is a structure, not an event, end quote. But indigeneity itself is enduring. The operative logic of settler colonialism may be to eliminate the native, but indigenous people and peoples, that is, as individuals and as collective polities, exist, resist, and persist. Settler colonialism is a structure that endures indigeneity even as it holds out against it. Taking settler colonialism as a structure seriously allows US scholars, for example, to challenge the normalization of dispossession as a done deal relegated to the past rather than ongoing. Mark Rifkin's book, Settler Common Sense, is useful here. He examines how, even while settler colonialism can be characterized as a structure, a system, and a logic, affective networks need to be explored as part of understanding how settler colonial governmentality comes to be lived as the self-evident condition of possibility for settler being. Examining how canonical American writers take part in the legacy of displacing Native Americans, he asks, how do varied administrative projects of settlement and accompanying legal categories, geographies, and subjectivities become part of everyday life for non-natives? Rifkin addresses that feeling of givenness and the kinds of social trajectories from which it emerges and which it engenders. Instead of suggesting that quotidian forms of settler sensation, selfhood, and possession follow obviously from policy and official legal mandates, he argues that the shifting boundaries of settler governance help provide orientation, inclination, and momentum for non-native experiences of the everyday. Two key scholars whose respective works on native New England speak to that concept of settler colonialism as a structure, and they're notably Amy Denowden, whose book I mentioned, and Jean O'Brien. Denowden has documented the complex cultural and political facets of Native American resistance to encroachment on reservation lands during the 18th century in southern New England in her book, Beyond Conquest, and the subtitle is Native Peoples and the Struggle for History in New England, she reconceptualizes indigenous histories and debates over native land rights with a focus on Mohegans, Pequots, and Niantics living on reservations in New London County, Connecticut, where they were under siege by colonists who employed various means to expropriate their reserved lands. At the same time, these indigenous peoples were also subjected to the policies of colonial government that sought to strictly control them and that determined native land rights by depicting reservation populations as culturally and politically illegitimate. And I want to just have a footnote. What she also noted is that they did that also at the time, not only when native people for their own survival were bringing in um, you know, intermixing, which is a euphemism, right? Rebuilding community with people of African and European descent, but also when women, native women were holding down the reservation because native men needed to part to go find labor in the wage economy and often were working on the ports. So that illegitimacy was also, the deemed illegitimacy was also a gendered process. However, reservation communities and their leaders engaged in multiple forms of resistance to dispossession. Beyond Conquest demonstrates how the current white scrutiny and denial of local Indian identities is a practice with a long history in southern New England, one linked to colonial notions of cultural and ultimately racial illegitimacy that emerged in the context of 18th century disputes regarding native land rights. So for those who are familiar with the Hawaiian situation, think about every time Kanaka Maoli, Kanaka Oivi talk about a, a, a Mauna Kea, our Aina, the sacredness of our homeland. Often what happens is that person will be personally attacked as to whether or not they're really Hawaiian. Right? They go for the jugular. And you'll see in the newspapers, oh, pinky finger Hawaiian, or do they even have anything? So it's a personal attack. That's where it comes from. It comes from here, right? It comes from here. The same, the first missionaries came from here, right? 
They're from southern New England. So it's the same kind of logics. And that's not to conflate the experiences of Kanaka Maoli, that is Native Hawaiians, with indigenous peoples in this region. But it's to show that the colonial logics at hand are also enduring and that they take root in other places. Works on local settler history and settler governmentality explain the structure. Gene O'Brien, in Firsting and Lasting, writing Indians out of existence in New England, theorizes the persistent myth of the vanishing Indian. She argues that local histories become a primary means by which European Americans assert their own modernity while denying it to Indian peoples. O'Brien examined more than 600 local histories from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, ranging from pamphlets to multi-volume treatments these narratives shared a preoccupation with establishing the region as the center of the Anglo-American nation, the Anglo-Saxon nation, and the center of a modern American culture. They also insisted, often in lamenting tones, that New England's original inhabitants had become extinct, even though many Indians still lived in the very towns being chronicled. And as she notes in the book, the same person, say, who's you know, the t at the town center and making a proclamation in front of a monument would have written in their private diary was complaining about, say, a Nipmuc family sitting in the same church pew at the same time they're pronouncing that there's no more Nipmuc people, right? So you have these contradictions. And they're tied to a, a bid for white American modernity that denounces uh, indigenous authenticity, uh, especially in relation to using African and, and European uh, mixed ancestry as evidence of that. Erasing then memorializing Indian peoples also served a more practical colonial goal, refuting Indian claims to land and rights. O'Brien found that in order to convince themselves that the Indians had vanished despite their continued presence, local historians and their readers embraced notions of racial purity rooted in the century scientific racism and saw living Indians as mixed and therefore no longer truly Indian. Adaptation to modern life on the part of indigenous peoples was also used as further evidence of their demise. But Indians did not and have not accepted this effacement. This formula persists as a pervasive part of the contemporary normalization of settler colonialism. So now I want to shift to my own journey and the work of anti-normalization, <coughs> fighting that erasure by learning about the elimination of the native or attempts to eliminate the native in Mattabesset. And one modest example that I um, launched as a project in an attempt to counter that logic and practice. Decolonizing Indigenous Middletown. In fall 2015, I taught a service learning course called Decolonizing Indigenous Middletown, Native Histories of the Wangunk Indian People. The class was designed in close consultation with Wangunk elder Gary O'Neill, a descendant of Jonathan Palmer, who was said to have been the last Wangunk. O'Neill is a genealogist of the remaining Wangunks in what is now known as Middlesex County and has served as an organizer and leader of the Wangunks since the 1970s. Um, I'll pause just to flag if we have time in the Q&A and anybody wants to ask how I met Gary O'Neill, that's a story in and of itself that would be interesting to share and it's, it's very much illustrates some of the themes that I'm presenting in my talk today. O'Neill. Gary was in conversation with our class the entire semester to guide the students and share his own priorities in terms of what he wanted to see as outcomes of the course. The service learning component of the class was a partnership with the Middlesex County Historical Society. And I can also talk about the ethics of that and why ultimately uh, Gary and I decided that it could not be him or Wangunk people. And there's a whole issue around that which has to do with the fact that they're not organized as a collective polity. So it would have, the short version is it would have been in partnership with one lone individual. And he agreed that the research that the students unearthed uh, should go into public archives that other people, Wangunk and non-Wangunk, would be able to uh, access. But I could say more about that because it, it, there's a whole set of ethics that came up in the process of the course regarding individuation, individual representation, and Wangunk people at large. At the Wangunk County Historical Society, students conducted archival research from the mid-17th century, which meant they also had to learn how to read the scribe of those town documents. They conducted archival research focused on the town proprietary records. Debbie Shapiro, then director of the Historical Society, enthusiastically worked with the students all semester as they conducted archival research there. Each logged three hours a week, this is outside of class, 
looking at mid-17th and 18th century documents in search of any mention or reference to Wangunk people in the English colonial period of Middletown. Notice I didn't say the colonial period of Middletown. We're still in the colonial period of Middletown. I said the English colonial period of Middletown. At that time, the Middlesex County Historical Society had one manila folder that said Native Americans, and it was about twice the size of this, and that's all they had in the entire historical society on Native peoples, and most of it was not related to Wangunk. So that's what we were dealing with. The students also researched the digitized issues of the Middlesex Gazette, which is now a defunct publication. And timing-wise, it was interesting. Those had only just been digitized in recent years, so it was a new um, development that they could actually go online and look at those. The course also included field trips to the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center so we could learn about rel related histories in this region, Indian Hill Cemetery in Middletown, and Founders Rock. And I'll talk more about that momentarily. Students learned about the field of settler colonial studies, the rapidly transforming field of critical indigenous studies, along with Native American history and historiography addressing southern New England. Taking up a decolonizing approach, we focused on the erasure of Wangunk history and the history of Wangunk erasure. The students read the few scholars of Wangunk history. Timothy Ives, who's the Rhode Island State archaeologist, Doris Shero, Paul Grant Costa mentioned earlier, Karen Cody Cooper, Sarah Schneider Cavanaugh, Catherine Hermes, and Alexandra Merivelle. In most cases regarding this scholarship, with the exception of Ives, each author has produced one or two articles, and not all of them are even full-length research articles. So even though I've given you a long line of names, I do want to note the paucity of material. I've been collecting these works for years, and finally, for 15 years, and finally got to critical mass in terms of being able to design a syllabus that includes this material in combination with broader studies of indigenous peoples in New England, including the studies by O'Brien and Den Auden mentioned earlier. We also read Linda Tuhivai Smith's book, Decolonizing Methodologies, to examine how research has historically served the colonial project, but alternately can have a role in indigenous struggles for social justice. And again, please consider coming to the event tomorrow on Mauna Awakea because you see a lot of the research is at University of Hawaii at Manoa. They're, they've partnered with the US military and NASA, and their research is in the service of a colonial violence. But it doesn't have to be that way. Regarding this course, I should also note that I was able to arrange a good number of guest speakers who visited with the students, including Vicki Welch, director of the Seven Generations Center for the Study of People of Color in New England, Tobias Glaza, Assistant Executive Editor of the Yellow Name Papers Project, and Jesse Cohen, Wesleyan's then Archaeology Collections Manager and Native American Graves Protection Act Compliance Officer, and then, of course, Gary O'Neill. We started the course by visiting, on the first, in the first week, Founders Rock, an historical marker on a boulder with a plaque located just outside of the gates of Riverside Cemetery, the earliest settler cemetery for English colonists. And what's interesting about this, you know, is this kind of colonial marker, is that it's just around the corner from this very famous diner, it, you know, divers, drive-ins, dives, whatever that show is. It's even been on that show. And most of the students go to that diner or know it, and people come from out of town, but have never been around the corner. So even that is hidden, okay? The plaque states, in 1639, Matabesic is first mentioned in the records. In 1650, the first English settlement was made near this spot. In 1653, the general court changed the name to Middletown. In 1672 and 1673, the title to the lands was confirmed by grant from the Indians in honor of the brave and God-fearing men who founded this town. Their descendants and successors have flagged this stone on the 250th anniversary of the settlement. So that's the text of the main plaque on the, on the left. It also lists to the right the first settlers, 1650 to 1654. I'll spare you reading all the names, but I have them in the footnotes if anybody's interested. And so-called, quote, Indian granters, 1672 to 1673, right? So classic move in New England. The Indians just signed it all away, you know? It wasn't stolen, it's by the stroke of a pen, right? This is what Scott Lyons calls the X mark. 
You know, it's not even about, it's, you know, talk, when I talk about consent politics, right? What did, what did if you have an Algonquian society that doesn't even have a propertized notion of land, what does it mean uh, in terms of these transactions and how we have to interrogate representations of them? The plaque is a prime example of what Jean O'Brien details in her earlier book, Dispossession by Degrees, Indian Land and, in, and Identity at Natick, Massachusetts, 1650 to 1790. In it, she documents how Indian lands were stolen incrementally through deeds, transfers, and sales. Those who signed deeds did not necessarily own the land even after the onset of ownership, and therefore indigenous individuals often later contested these sales. Later, and I don't have a picture of it, um, but it's on the other side, a new plaque was added to the west side of the rock to honor the settler women. Colonial feminism, right? In honor of the courageous and unselfish women who settled this town, their descendants and successors dedicate this monument on the 350th anniversary of the settlement. So it took 100 years, but the women got their due. You know, take responsibility, claim it, right? So now I want to just pause to recount some of the history of Wayne Gunk and then shift back to the course just to give you a sense of how deep the history of dispossession and erasure is. Sources suggest that the Wangunks' proximity to the Connecticut River made their homeland desirable for European fur traders, leading to conflicts with the Pequot tribe over the area. Wangunks allied with Narragansetts and reached out to English settlers as defensive strategies against the Pequot, but alliances may have shifted with the outbreak of the Pequot War in 1637, right, the first all-out genocidal massacre in, in uh, North America. Colonial accounts suggest that Wangunk Sachem Sawiga assisted the Pequots in their attack on Weathersfield, where he resided at the time. And in that same period, he relocated to Matabeset, later to become Middletown. From 1650 on, natives and settlers living in Middletown are documented as engaging in a series of these land transactions, culminating in a written reservation deed in 1673. Connecticut's colonial government reserved approximately 350 acres of land on the east side of the Connecticut River for the descendants of that Wangunk uh, Sachem and the Wangunk people at large. As we know from the work of Timothy Ives mentioned before, the reservation remained undefined until 1673 when 13 of Sawiage's heirs signed a document which created two parcels, one of 50 acres at Indian Hill, which I'll tell you more about, and another of 250 acres on the east side of the Connecticut River. Reservation land was specified as belonging to Wangunk heirs forever, but that would not last long. Wangunk land ownership remained largely communal into the reservation period until some individuals were compelled to sand, sell land to colonists, often to pay debts. Right, predatory lending goes back a long way. The English population of Middletown grew, and by 1714, this group of settlers split from Middletown and formed the Third Society of Middletown, which had its own meeting house and separate leadership. As documented by Ives, by 1713, Wangunks had been forced to vacate the Matabeset portion of the reservation, which was in central Middletown. Settler encroachment on Indian land accelerated in 1732 when the Third Society got a new pastor who built his home on the reservation. Some Wangunks began converting to Christianity during this period, resulting in migration to Christian Indian communities. In 1746, the Third Society petitioned the Connecticut General Assembly for a new meeting house and was granted land right on the Wangunk Reservation. Settlers petitioned twice more to buy the reservation lands, and due to colonial debt, the remaining Wangunks were pressured to sell the land, the, the rest of their land as payment. By 1767, the Third Society officially became the town of Chatham, which was later uh, renamed Portland. The last part of the Wangunk Reservation was sold somewhere between 1772 and 1784. But the Wangunk community remained active throughout this period, although their numbers were severely reduced. One report estimated the number of Wangunks in Portland at just 28 in 1777. In the 18th century, many Wangunks moved away from the reservation, some folding into other tribes from the adjacent regions. As Paul Grant Costa shows in some of his work, Wangunks joined the Farmington Indians in Connecticut, a group that formed when the Tungsus invited other indigenous individual, individuals to move to their reservation as Christian Indians. 
They later moved to Oneida, New York, and then to Brotherton, uh, Wisconsin. In terms of documentation of the Wangunks into the 19th century, we know of Betty Nepash through the work of Dara Shero of the Portland Historical Society. Nepash held yearly tribal gatherings until the 1810s, and after her death, Jonathan Palmer was named the last Indian in Middletown when he died in 1813. However, the Palmer family line has survived into the present, and many members continue to live in Middlesex County. That is Gary O'Neill's extended family. Now shifting my discussion back to the class, we also visited Indian Hill Cemetery, which is right next to Wesleyan's campus. The site was once a thriving Wangunk village that later became part of the initial reservation during the English colonial reservation period. In 1850, settler descendants repurposed the hill as a rural cemetery for their own burials, creating a place for Middletown's most historically prominent families to be buried. As Wesleyan alumna Sarah Cavanaugh writes about the site, quote, as American citizens realized that their experiment in Republican government had the potential for a limitless future, excuse me, for a limitless future, they were faced with the daunting task of, re of constructing themselves, for themselves, an immemorial past. So this is an alumna who wrote this paper in a class that a colleague of mine taught in 2004 that she later developed after graduation and is now in an edited volume. It's one of the few things on Wayne Gunk, and that was just written you know, not that long ago. It's an excellent article, and she does some incredible work theorizing it. And it's also really interesting to teach it because all of the key prominent families, you know, all of our buildings at Wesleyan are named after them. So it really makes things pop for the students, right? It brings this colonial history uh, really forcefully into the present. On the gates of the cemetery is also a stereotypical image of a noble savage, one of the only markers today of the land's uh, English colonial history and enduring colonial present. One of the most memorial aspects of the course was when O'Neill and Cohen, who I mentioned earlier, who used to be our NAGPRA compliance officer and head of the archaeology collection, did a joint presentation. I, oh, I don't have too many photos, but I do want to show you. That's Gary O'Neill with uh, Jesse Cohen and some pottery shards. Cohen presented pottery shards from the Wesleyan University archaeology and anthropology, anthropology collections that are from the immediate location and are presumed to be Wangunk. Now, she was brand new, and this was a 12-year battle to get a NAGPRA compliance officer hired at Wesleyan, which is an, another whole story. But when I met Gary, and I'd been looking for Wangunk for years, I found out that he is a ceramicist and works at Wesleyan Potters, literally around the corner from my home. And it's called Wesleyan Potters, but it's not affiliated with the campus. And I also found out he's a Wesleyan alumnus. So he's literally around the corner. And so when she got wind that he's a ceramicist, she says, I have these, these boxes of pottery shards, and they're from right here. So the two came together in the classroom. And some of these pieces included markings and impressions on pottery that dated 400 to 1,000 years ago. Meanwhile, O'Neill insisted that the students had to make Indian pinch pots, which some of you might remember doing in elementary school, right? He wanted the students to have a tactile memory while he narrated his family's oral history, and he wanted their listening to be manifest in that material object that they would eventually take with them. He said, they will not forget my history. They will have that. Each of them will have their own design. He spoke about his great-grandmother and his grandmother and how they both influenced him through their storytelling and their strength as matriarchal figures in a large extended kinship network. He also spoke about how their stories and histories that they told him were starting points in his own archival research. He recalled names and places and used those as guiding points in tracing his family's line back to Jonathan Palmer. And Jonathan Palmer, who I've mentioned earlier, is featured in a 1930s text that's PDF'd online if anybody's curious. It's called Yankee Township, and Jonathan Palmer is referred to as Jonathan Indian. And basically, it's basically narrating this sort of romanticized account of the last full blood Wangunk. And we see, again, this is a, an ongoing pervasive tactic used to discount Native American presence um, in the contemporary period and throughout history. As that semester was wrapping up, 
In December 2015, I organized a public forum linked to the course. The event was held on Wesleyan's campus at Russell House, and we called the event Indigenous Middletown, Settler Colonial and Wangunk Tribal History. I noted in my introduction that day, one of the goals of the course was to collectively produce a Wikipedia entry on Wangunk. I also remarked that while Russell House itself had a wiki entry, the Wangunk did not. What did it mean that we could readily learn more about the building we were sitting in because of the prominence of the Russell family that day than we could about the people of the land we were occupying? The event included Lucianne Lavin, Director of Research and Collections at the Institute for American Indian Studies, a museum and research and educational center in Washington, Connecticut. She is a founding member of the state's Native American Heritage Advisory Council. Those are some more of the shards. This is at the Center for the Americas at Wesleyan. There's Gary with some of the pinch pots the students made. And that's the flyer uh, for this first event. She is founding member of the state's Native American Heritage Advisory Council and editor of the Journal of the Archaeolo Archaeological Society of Connecticut. And one of her books had just come out two years prior called Connecticut's Indigenous Peoples, What Archaeology, History, and Oral Tradition Teach Us About Their Communities and Cultures. So she was one of the panelists. The second panelist was Timothy Ives, who I mentioned is the principal archaeologist for the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission. His doctoral thesis, produced at the College of William and Mary, focused on Wangunk ethnohistory. It's the bulk of the work that's out there. And from that uh, study, he has publications on the Wangunk Reservation land system, as well as Wangunk community formations in 17th century central Connecticut. I will say that he had met Gary once before, or maybe a couple times before, but it was after this panel, because he said on this panel that he had traced his own genealogy to colonial settlers and had to reckon with his own genealogy of being in that area. And I've talked to them not that long ago, like last year, and they're basically, he's going to revisit his doctoral thesis in conjunction with Gary and do some sort of co-publication, because he hasn't advanced more than the two articles. So that's one of the developments in terms of thinking together, being together, and trying to figure out uh, what accountability looks like in this kind of 21st century context where you have a, a very invisible demographic of the indigenous people of the place that we're at. The third panelist was someone the students specifically requested because they wanted to hear a settler perspective. And I said, well, none of us are Wangunks, so we're all sort of, right, we, we can identify as indigenous, we can identify, we could be a war refugee, could be a, a descendant of a slave, right, but we're not here. We're not, we're not Wangunk here, and so part of it is they wanted somebody representative, you know, from that era. And so we found him, Reginald W. Bacon, who serves on the board of several history and preservation organizations, including the Society of Middletown First Settlers Descendants. <laughs> For the last decade, he has been an editor of that organization's newsletter called The Midler. Not, yeah, not Midler, Midler, which circulates to members in selected libraries across the United States. And that book, the book that materialized from his editorship is titled Early Families in Middletown, Connecticut, Volume 1, 1650 to 1654. And last but definitely not least was Gary O'Neill, who shared his family genealogy and compelling stories of family survival tactics tracing from his great-grandmother, Kate Eldora Bates Palmer, who was a Nipmuc Indian born in 1879 and who married a Wangunk man. The following <coughs> semester, even though our class had ended, I organized a public event at the town library, Russell Library, off campus but named for the same Russells. There, students willing to present their research findings would share with the broader community. We called the event Looking for Indigenous Middletown in Colonial Archives. Because when we got to the end of the course, the students said, we can't even talk about it as decolonizing Indigenous Middletown because we're still trying to understand Indigenous Middletown. So, hence, looking for indigenous Middletown in colonial archives, settler erasure, and Wangunk Indian tribal history. This was held in March 2016. In the end, just four out of the 11 students who had been in the class presented their work. Irielis Lopez on behalf of a paper she co-wrote with Taina Quinones, Maya Ruman Moore, Abigail Kunif, and Yael Horowitz. The event, just like the earlier panel, was co-sponsored by the Center for the Americas and the American Studies Department. One of the most exciting productions of the students, um, besides the Wikipedia entry on Wangunk, were that their papers 
uh, have now been included in a special issue of the Bulletin of the Archaeological Society of Connecticut. The Bulletin's editor, Lavin, who was on, in attendance on the first panel and in attendance at the second, said that she was so inspired and impressed by the students' research that she thought that there was enough critical mass to do a special issue. And um, the published papers include titles such as Town Bills of Middletown, Material Histories of Settler Colonialism and Indigenous Erasure by Horowitz, Decolonizing Indigenous Middletown by Lopez and Quinones, and one titled Militia, Security, and Smallpox in Middletown Settler Society as Related to the Wangunk People, 1754 to 1785 by Kunuf. Additionally, transcripts of the presentations from the other event were included. And there are also several, several two, two actually, a couple new articles by some of the local historians who had heard about the project and returned to projects that they had abandoned long ago. And so they jump-started or revived those earlier works. In reflecting on this project, I have to say there were numerous challenges and obstacles, practical, conceptual, and ethical. And I can speak more to those in the Q&A if there's time and interest. My point is that decolonial research must be part of decolonization in the settler colonial context. Now I want to shift gears to talk more about theories of decolonization and decoloniality. In the darker side of Western modernity, Walter Mignolo defines, quote, the underlying logic of the foundation and unfolding of Western civilization from the Renaissance to today, what he terms the colonial matrix of power. As he argues, coloniality is foundationally interconnected to historical colonialisms. Vast differences exist in the histories, socioeconomics, and geographies of colonization in its various global manifestations. For example, in the Americas, this took a different shape than English colonization in North America. Spanish colonization in the Americas took a different shape than English colonization in North America. However, as Mignolo argues, coloniality, the establishment of racialized and gendered socioeconomic and political hierarchies according to an invented Eurocentric standard, is all part of colonization. Hence, we must reckon with the dominance of coloniality. This entails an understanding of decolonization beyond its limited scope within the law or the easily available historical and political case studies of former colonies. And Hawaiians in the room, you know, this might resonate for you because we have people in our own nationalist movement who deny that we were ever colonized because they have a very narrow, fixed definition of colonization. And they're reading juridically, saying, you know, we couldn't have been colonized because we had an independent state. Right? That's a non sequitur. But also, to think about decolonization beyond the bounds of the law and think about this as the logic of Western civilization. Even if we buy that logic, right, we have to look deeper. Moreover, Mignolo argues um, that coloniality manifested throughout the world uh, in terms of the epistemological value systems of contemporary society, commonly called modern society. This is precisely why coloniality does not just disappear with political and historical decolonization, the end of the period of territorial domination of lands when countries gain independence, right, the post-colonial third world model, right? This is where the concept of decoloniality is critical. As Mignolo explains, decoloniality is a term used principally by emerging Latin American movements and refers to, quote, analytic approaches and socioeconomic and political practices opposed to pillars of Western civilization, coloniality, and modernity, end quote. This makes it both a political and epistemic that is relating to knowledge and its validation, an epistemic project. It is the refusal of the assumption that Western European modes of thinking are in fact universal ones, or that the Western ways are the best. To be clear, this is not about suggesting the possibility of restoring a people to an original condition, as if one could. Instead, this is about enduring indigeneity. And I want to acknowledge also the work of Silvia Rivera, who has been in conversation, critical conversation with Mignola, and writing about that from the indigenous point in pushing on that and what it means in reality. And she takes on a lot of Latin Americanist academics who are not actually working in concert with indigenous decolonization. What can decolonization mean in a settler colonial context? 
Drawing on France Fanon, Lisa Lowe offers a short working definition of decolonization as, quote, the social formation that encompasses a multi-level and multi-centered assault on those specific forms of colonial rule, end quote. But part of the problem in contemporary settler colonial context is that non-Native people have a hard time understanding or even believing that Indigenous peoples are still subject to colonial rule. This is an issue of both willful ignorance and denial. In Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon examined the relationship between race and colonialism to explore the traumatic impact of the sense of inferiority on colonized people and how it often leads them to identify with the colonizer. Looking at how colonial domination perpetuates the psychology of the racism and dehumanization, taking up psychoanalytic theory, Fanon explains the feelings of dependency and inadequacy of black colonized subjects' experiences in relation to white domination. One of the key elements of this work that rarely gets addressed, though, is that he theorized the divided self-perception of the black subject as one who has lost their native cultural origin. This is key to his theorization, since, as Fanon contends, it produces an inferiority complex in the mind of the black subject, who, he argues, then tries to appropriate and imitate the culture of the colonizer, hence their white masks. This work is based on the master-slave dialectic of black and white racial polarities, a formulation that I suggest cannot be mapped onto the settler colonial indigenous dynamic without accounting for the differences in the type of colonialism that Fanon was theorizing in black skin, white masks. In other words, it cannot be simply appropriated in a settler colonial context vis-a-vis -vis indigeneity for several reasons. For one, the question of indigenous subjects in relation to native cultural origins differs from dislocated black subjects who descend from the enslaved, taken from their homelands, and cut off from their neonatal origins. This would have gross ramifications for not having access to indigenous cultural traditions and knowledge of the land that many indigenous people, say, here in North America, uh, have, even as settler colonialism has tried to deracinate indigenous individuals and peoples to uproot them and sever that relationship. Racialization also does not work in the same way. There's arguably no racial binary between the red, white, or white red that functions in ways comparable to white black. Fanon's theory is premised on the binary of the white black that emerges from slavery, not land expropriation of indigenous peoples and the settler colonial violence of structural genocide that includes, as mentioned before, forms of biocultural assimilation. But also Fanon does not account for either Carib or Arawak indigeneity in the French Antilles in his theorization of colonial domination and the psychic violence produced by black subordination. That is an absence that creates an epistemological problem that we need to account for when drawing on this particular work of his. We must productively formulate indigenous critiques of black skin white masks to account for the erasure of, the, of indigeneity, or at least draw on that remarkable text in more critical ways given that its application to settler colonial contexts is structurally limited. Now, concluding, what I want to leave you with is that within the rubric of decolonization, I suggest a critical assessment of pre-colonial epistems and cultural practices. Yet the specter of the pre-colonial is too often viewed as an assertion of an essential or primordial world in, evoked in a problematic bid to claim purity in the service of a retrograde and exclusive form of ethnic nationalism. That's often the charge. In US settler colonial society, though, the undeniability of indigenous societies demands an engagement with the question of the pre-colonial. And we must also acknowledge the ways in which indigenous people and peoples adapted new forms into their own cultural logics and practices in ways that mark strong continuities that often go unappreciated. There are rich examples of decolonial indigenous resurgence efforts in this region and other indigenous worlds beyond. These are grounded in non-statist or anti-statist, in many cases, forms of indigenous, what we might call sovereignty, that tend to the power and life forces of interconnectedness between deities, ancestral forces, humans and other animals, and all elements of the natural world. These forms of governance are distinctly different from the Western concept of sovereignty, right? Hence my scare quotes around the S word. We know that indigenous peoples need not rely 
on the U.S. state or its subsidiaries, nor for federal recognition. Decolonization is imperative for everyone striving to live in a world without non-consensual domination. But the practice looks different for indigenous people and peoples than for those living on lands they are not indigenous to. Decolonization is a practice that must entail an understanding of the settler colonial project as a structure and countering the logic of elimination of the native. Mahalo. Thank you.